So the past few months have been a time of kind of self-reflection for me. And that's a little bit surprising because I am not one uh, that likes to think about the past very much or think about what has been. I'm kind of one that likes to move on toward the future, to what is, what could be. Uh, but the past few months I've had time to reflect and, and I'm also not great at it. Like I, I don't like sitting in silence and in processing too much. As a matter of fact, sometimes I, I tend to doze off a bit when I do that. Um, so it's just not something that is, is part of my DNA or something that I really enjoy doing. It's something I have to make myself do. But there have been some circumstances in our world, in my life, that have caused me to do a little bit of self-reflection the last few months. Uh, I think 2020 caused everybody to do self-reflection. And then, of course, we're moving into a new year. So that usually causes you to, to think about what has been and, and what you might be able to improve going forward. I turned 50 in October. And I think, I don't know, that seems like it, it, you'd like to think maybe it's the midway point of your life. I'm sure it's past midway for most of us, but you start to kind of think about things in a different way and, and where you've been and a little bit where you're going. And, and also um, just the daily grind of life. Sometimes the struggles get you to stop and, and think and process. And then about three weeks ago, my dad passed away. And when someone that significant in your life leaves this world, it causes you to pause. It causes you to stop and think and process and ponder. First, you look at their life and how did they live their life? How did they treat people? How did they embrace the world? How did people feel about them? How will they be remembered? What will their legacy be? And I've spent a lot of time in the last few weeks processing that about my own father. But then it turns to yourself and you start thinking about, well, well what am I like? And, and how do I treat people? And, and how do people view me? And, and what's my calling in the world? And am I living out that calling? How will I be remembered? What will my legacy be? Yeah, the past couple of months have given me pause to stop and ponder and reflect on really who I am and what is my calling in this world. And I can't think of a, of a book in the Bible or scripture in the Bible or, or somebody that I would want to help guide me and mentor me through this more than the book of Philippians and the Apostle Paul. And that's why I'm so glad that we have kicked off 2021 in Philippians, in this series together, looking at the book of Philippians and what Paul has to say to the church in Philippi and really to all of us about what it means to truly embrace our relationship with Jesus Christ and live out who he calls us to be. As individuals, yes, but as a church together, moving into a broken, a very broken world with his call on our hearts. And that's why we're in this series. And this is one of our BYOB series, Bring Your Own Bible, where we look at, at the three texts, the three worlds behind those texts. And we look at the world behind the text, the world of the text, and the world in front of the text. And hopefully you've taken advantage of all the different options that we've had during this series. And I think you can still join our BYOB Facebook page where there's lots of conversation and, and sharing. It's been a great spot to dig deeper uh, into this BYOB series and the book of Philippians. So that's where we are. And I get to close the book today, um, kind of looking at the whole book and really focusing on chapter four, the last chapter of the book of Philippians. So you can go ahead and turn to the book of Philippians. Now I wanna tell you this, sometimes you might wonder why I don't have my Bible up here. Um, 
and and you will know because you're going to be looking in your Bible that I am everything I'm reading from the Bible is from the scripture that you're seeing in your Bible. The reason I don't is because I'm still a little too vain to put my readers on my reading glasses when I'm up here. So when I do it on my sheet and write out the scripture, I can make it in 16 font so I don't have to put my readers on. So it's really just a very prideful and ridiculous thing. But that's why I don't actually read directly from the Bible and I write out the scriptures on my sheets. Not that you even cared to know that, but it's a funny fact about me. All right. So we're going to dig in first to the world behind the text. And I want to say this, many of us that grew up in the church have heard about the Apostle Paul for years, um, all through our growing up. But I'm just going to remind you of who he was. And for those of you that have no idea who I'm talking about, this will give you a little background to who the Apostle Paul was and why he's so important to us uh, in the Christian world. First of all, the Apostle Paul, Saul, and, and the names are interchangeable, and I'll explain that in a moment. Um, many of you know his story. After Jesus' death and resurrection, Saul was one of those who persecuted Christians. Not only did he not acknowledge Jesus as the Savior and the King and the Messiah, he persecuted and went after those that did believe that. And so one day he's traveling on a road um, from Jerusalem to Damascus and he's on a mission that day to arrest Jesus' followers and Jesus appears to Saul in this bright light, kind of knocks him to the ground and he blinds Paul. For three days, Paul is blinded until God sends Ananias to restore Paul's vision and from that moment on, Paul is sold out to the mission and the call of Jesus. He acknowledges Jesus as his Lord and his King, and he makes it his life's work to tell everyone else about Jesus. Half of the book of Acts is about Jesus or about Paul's life and ministry. And, and Paul is credited with writing 14 books of the 27 books in the New Testament. They're traditionally attributed to Paul. Now there's some dispute as to whether he was actually the author of all of those, but let's just say Paul was a big deal, okay? He was a big deal. And his ministry reached far and wide. And the establishment of the church in the greater sense, the church we know today has much to do with Paul in his ministry. And I love that what we read about in Philippians, in the Bible about Paul, and particularly in this book, has a direct connection to who we are today to Grace Church, we can be linked back to Paul and the work we hear about him doing in the New Testament. I think that is amazing. And so this interesting tidbit about Paul that I found out about the two names, Saul and Paul, which this was news to me and I grew up in the church and some of you may be like, Amy, this is Bible 101. Um, I knew this, I've always known this, but I did not know this fascinating tidbit about the two names Saul and Paul. So it was common for Jewish people at this time to have two names, a Hebrew na name, and that his Hebrew name was Saul, and then a Greek or Latin name. And because Paul was a Roman citizen, he also had a, a Greek, a Latin name, which was Paul. So Saul and Paul, his names were interchangeable, but he used Paul when writing to his readers because that would have been the language and the style his readers would have been used to. And Paul wanted to be relatable. He wanted to relate to the people that he was talking to and the people that he was writing to. So he spoke to them with a name and with words that made sense to them. I love that about him. That's so much like Jesus being able to relate to the people that are right in front of you. So the church in Philippi is the first Jesus community that Paul starts in Eastern Europe. It's a Roman colony um, that citizens consist mainly of retired soldiers. There's a lot of patriotic nationalism. I think that's something that we can relate to today. And they are very resistant this group of people is very resistant to Jesus being the king of the world. 
They are not about that. They are not for it. And so uh, those that continued to follow Jesus in Philippi faced resistance and persecution. It was not an easy road for them, but they were a committed group of Christ followers. And they were so committed that when Paul was imprisoned, and this was one of many imprisonments, when he was imprisoned during this time, uh, the church in Philippi sent aid to him. They sent money to him. They were so committed to his ministry and the ministry of Jesus that they sent him help. And this letter, Philippians, is the letter back to them after they've sent that help to Paul. And so you will see in this letter, there is a, a great deal of gratitude and thankfulness, uh, but it goes even deeper than that. So that's a little bit of the world behind the text. And now we're gonna turn to the world in, in the world of the text. What does the text itself say? And first I wanna tell you a little bit about the book as a whole. So the book of Philippians, it's, it's not one letter that is continuous from beginning to end, but it's several ideas that are centered on a poem that is in the middle of this book or this letter. And the poem is in chapter two, starting in verse six. So if you wanna turn there quickly to chapter two, Philippians chapter two, verse six, um, we're gonna start right there. And we're actually gonna start in verse five. So listen and read along with me. Philippians 2, verse 5. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privilege. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father." So this is the poem that the whole letter kind of centers on. This is Jesus. This is the story that Paul is giving his life to. And the rest of the book essentially is essays that take key words from that poem in chapter two and go on to explain or describe how living as a Christian, being a citizen of the kingdom of God is living out the story of Jesus. Throughout Philippians, Paul is saying your own story, our own story should be a living expression of the story of Jesus. The, to the world, we should be the hands and feet of Jesus. And Paul is telling us why and how through the book of Philippians. Remember, he starts in that poem, when he, when he starts there in verse five, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. So he goes on in the book and in chapter two, he gives examples of, a, of people in his own life that are living out that story of Jesus. And then in chapter three, Paul talks about his life, Paul's life and his life following Jesus and how he's now a citizen of heaven and everything, everything else is garbage, he says. Everything else is worthless except his life in Christ and gaining Christ and becoming one with him. In this last section, chapter four, the section we're going to look at today is the close. It's the last chapter where Paul turns it toward the Philippians. And he's going to challenge them to live out the example that he has set for them. But more importantly, that Jesus has set for them. He is asking them to be good citizens. And he's asking them to be good citizens of Philippi. Yes, yes. But more importantly, he's asking them to be good citizens of the kingdom of God. So let's look first in, in Philippians uh, 4, 2, and I'm not going to read it. I'm just going to explain what's happening here. Paul is imploring two prominent female leaders to deal with their dispute. He names them by name, 
which means uh, that he's close to them. He knows them well. Um, he's done ministry with these two women and he does not want the ministry that they've done to become derailed by a petty dispute. So he's saying, make it right, be unified, show humility and reconcile. He's so concerned with this that in verse three, he says, and I ask you, my true partner, to help these two women for they worked hard with me in telling others the good news. It is so important to him that he's imploring his true partner, someone he trusts to help, to bring unity back to the church, to the community of Christians is very, very important. So he's saying that good citizens live in unity. This is something that we as the church today should think long and hard about in the divisive world that we live in. Paul is calling the church in Philippi and calling us to be good citizens that live in unity. Then let's look in verse uh, four. Look with me and we're gonna read this starting in verse four. Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember, the Lord is coming soon. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and mind as you live in Christ Jesus. Now in these verses, these set of ideas are distinctly Christian. Good citizens of heaven are full of joy, not temporary joy, but joy that comes from a deep relationship with the Lord. They, they are considerate in all they do. They show the world gentleness. They show that toward each other as fellow believers, but they show that to the broader world, to the broader public, even to those that might be making their lives miserable just like Jesus did. In 1 Peter 2, 23, it says, he did not retaliate when he was insulted, nor threaten revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God, who always judges fairly. If we are to be like Jesus, which is what Paul is calling us to and calling the church to, then we live in gentleness and consideration, not in retaliation. More powerful words for us in the world we live in today. And that line in verse five, remember the Lord is coming soon. Well, this could be a follow-up to the line that has come before it. Be considerate because the Lord is coming soon. Or it could be leading into the next line. Don't be anxious because the Lord is coming soon. Meaning the Lord is is near. Either way, it's a reminder that even, even in their suffering, at the hands of those who proclaim Caesar as Lord, the true Lord is near, is coming. They can call on him. Verse eight, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Don't worry, pray. God is near and God will give you peace. You don't, you don't have to worry because your utter dependence is on God and you can give thanks because you have trust in God. Paul could not imagine a Christian life that was not steeped in thanksgiving. So these verses say good citizens are full of joy. Good citizens are considerate and gentle. Good citizens are characterized by peace. And good citizens don't worry, but instead pray. Then verse eight begins a list of virtues that actually would have been very familiar to his readers. These are virtues that can be found in many secular lists of Greek virtues. They're they're generally understood by the public virtues. His readers would have heard these virtues many, many times, not just in uh, the letter from Paul. And these things are worthy of thinking about. 
So Paul is melding two worlds here. The first is the list of Christian virtues. The second is followed by common virtues in the Greek world. And again, he's melding these two worlds together. This second list, meeting people where they are and putting this common list of virtues in the context of Jesus changes their value and importance for his followers. So let's look at verse eight. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Good citizens fix their thoughts on what is good and honorable. Again, can you imagine in the world that we live in today, if we were fixing ourselves on what is good and honorable and right and just and true. <clears throat> then Paul writes in verse nine, keep putting into practice all you have learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing, then the God of peace will be with you. Paul is saying, I'm a good citizen. Follow me as I follow Jesus. So let's move on to verse 10. What does he have to say here? He says this, follow with me. How I praise the Lord that you are concerned about me. Again, talking to the church in Philippi. I know you have always been concerned for me, but you didn't have the chance to help me. Not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I've learned the secret of living in every situation, whether, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Paul is definitely saying a true heartfelt thank you to his friends for their gift. He is so grateful to them. But then in verse 11 and 12, he is saying, but make no mistake, even without the gift, I have learned to live with whatever I have. He's lived in all sorts of different situations, good and bad, nothing and everything, empty and plenty. And they could think, before we get to verse 13, they could think that he's talking about self-sufficiency. Like, you don't, you don't need to take care of me. I'm good. I can take care of myself, which is a very modern way of thinking. Many people in our world feel that way. I feel that way sometimes. I can, I can do it on my own. And so they might have thought that's what he meant until you get to verse 13. He's not talking about self-sufficiency. He's talking about Christ's sufficiency. I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. He is a man of Christ. He is absolutely Christ-centered in his life. He will take on whatever comes in his life because of his Christ-centeredness. If it means plenty, he's a man of Christ. And that alone if it means want, he is still a man in Christ and accepts the hardships. As a matter of fact, he almost accepts the hardships as a gift. He sees his own suffering as a participation in the story of Jesus. A follower of Jesus knows that all of life is a gift. You can see beauty and grace in all circumstances. And hardship as Paul can attest to, can be one of our greatest teachers. He has learned the secret of contentment in all circumstances. It is simply dependence on the one who gives him strength. Good citizens put their full trust in dependence in Jesus. And good citizens find contentment in all circumstances. This, this book, this whole book, chapter four and all the other chapters are a unique window into Paul's heart and mind. He saw his life as a reenactment of Jesus' story and his awareness of Jesus' love and presence gave him hope and humility 
and he is sharing that with his readers then and with all of us now. He was a good citizen of the kingdom of God, of the kingdom of heaven. Are you a good citizen? Now the world in front of the text. Am I a good citizen? Are you a good citizen? As I mentioned earlier, my dad passed away about three weeks ago. And uh, again, this has given me, um, he went in the hospital in November with COVID and we thought he survived it, um, but he did not. And in the end, uh, he was just too weak and couldn't, couldn't beat it. And, and it ended up taking his life on January 7th, which has been very difficult for, for my family. But as I said, it's given me a lot of time to ponder my dad's life. And I knew I was gonna be speaking uh, on the book of Philippians, so it's given me a lot of time as I've been preparing for this to think about Paul's life. And I gotta tell you, there are a lot of similarities between these two men. Now, I'm not gonna say that my dad was at the same level as the apostle Paul, but they had a lot in common. My dad, like Paul, had a very succinct come to Jesus moment. Now, I don't know that Jesus appeared to him in a light or blinded him. I know he didn't blind him for three days, but my dad had a significant moment. After he married my mom, she was making him go to church because she felt it was important now that they were gonna be a family. And he went forward one night at that church. He's told me this story many times during an altar call fell to his knees weeping and truly gave his life to Jesus Christ in that moment. And he would say it was a come to Jesus, turn your life around, 180 degree change in his life that he never turned back from. My dad, the Holy Spirit came upon him that night. And from that moment on, his journey was with Jesus. And he knew the power and peace and promise of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And he wanted the entire world to know that and have that too. Just like Paul. And just like Paul, the church was important to my dad. He was a founding member of two churches and he was a deacon and an elder for many years at both of those churches, grace included. And he ended his time of ministry when he was still able to be at church being a greeter. Many of you may have seen him at 146th Street uh, greeting every Sunday between the nine and o'clock, nine o'clock and 11 o'clock service. And it brought me such joy to hear about my dad and his jokes and his smile. He made people feel better when they left him. They felt full of joy. And I'd like to think that in that way, Paul is like my dad. I hope that Paul made people feel full of joy and I wanna believe and believe that he did. My dad even made people feel full of joy when he was coming at them with a drill and they were sitting in his dental chair. I'm not kidding, people said that. They, they were not scared to go to the dentist when the dentist was my dad. And like my dad, like Paul, my dad found Jesus at an, a later stage in life. So once he full, fully understood the redemption and reconciliation and re restoration that comes from relationship with Jesus, he wanted the entire world to know that. And he made it his mission to share that good news with everybody that came in contact with him in his dental practice, through prison ministry, to every friend he ever had from high school and beyond, to his family and coworkers. My dad was committed to the healing of the broken places of the world world, the number one being separation from God. That was his life's mission. And just like Paul, toward the end of his life, my dad was in his own sort of prison. He'd been in the assisted living facility since March, where he could barely get out and see people. And his last nine days before he got to go home from the hospital and die peacefully at home, he was stuck in the hospital with no one there and he couldn't get his hearing aids to work so he couldn't communicate with anyone. And for my dad, that was like being in prison. But even in those circumstances, my dad knew who had his life in his hands and that was Jesus. And even in what would have been a prison to my dad in that hospital, not being able to hear or communicate, 
He had faith and hope and strength in Jesus. And like Paul, my dad was a good citizen of the kingdom of God. So as I've read Philippians and the words Paul has to say to all of us, I feel like they easily could have been the words that my dad had to say to me. How to be a good citizen in the kingdom of God. So I'm just gonna share a few of those with you. First, when you're a good citizen, you don't forget where your true allegiance lies. Philippians 1.27, above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. Number two, good citizens realize that God will never give up on you. Philippians 1.6, and I am certain that God, he who began a good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. Three, good citizens put others first and practice self-giving love. Philippians 2, 3, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Four, good citizens realize there is nothing, nothing more important than our relationship with Jesus. Philippians 3, 8, yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Number five, Jesus is always enough. Good citizens know this. He is always enough no matter the circumstances. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I've learned the secret of living in every situation again, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, plenty or little, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Philippians 4, 12 to 13. And number six, we as good citizens, we have a calling to spread the gospel and heal the brokenness of the world in the name of Jesus. For I fully expect and hope that I will never be ashamed, but that I will continue to be bold for Christ as I have been in the past. And I trust that my life will bring honor to Christ, whether I live or die. For me, living means living for Christ. Number seven, we have a promised future of redemption. We know that as good citizens, the end of that verse. For me, living means living for Christ, but the end of the verse and dying is even better. Philippians 1, 21. And my dad knows that now. Now my dad is a good citizen in the kingdom of heaven. This is what you should shape your entire lives around. This is what your lives should strive to be. As I look at the example of Paul and personally the example of my dad for me, this is what I see in them. Men that truly understand the beauty and brilliance of what Jesus did for us and men that gave their entire lives to sharing that beauty and brilliance with the entire world and calling others to it. They want me to know, they want you to know, they want all of us to know. If you claim Jesus, if you claim him as your Lord and Savior, if you say you have surrendered to him, then act like it. Live like it. Love like it. We're getting ready to start a series next week talking about the credibility gap and why there's a generation that's coming behind me that doesn't trust the church anymore and doesn't trust Christians. And you wanna know why I think that is? The number one reason is because so many of us who claim that we love Jesus do not live like it. We are not good citizens of the kingdom of God. We do not live out what Paul is calling the church to be in Philippians. And they see that and they don't trust the church and ultimately may not trust Jesus because of what we are doing and how we are behaving. If we love Jesus, 
Paul is telling us to act like it and live like it and love like it. Can that be your mission for 2021? Can you help bridge that credibility gap because you are willing to put your actions where your words are? You are willing to live out the love that you say you have for Jesus. Be a good citizen. And for those of you that don't even maybe totally understand what I'm talking about because you've never surrendered to Jesus, you've never, you've never latched on to this life that Paul is describing here, why not? Don't you want the beauty and the brilliance of a relationship with Jesus Christ, this transformative life? You can become a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, of the kingdom of God. And that is a far greater call than being a citizen of this world. Because the citizenship to the kingdom of heaven, you have a king of humility and kindness and mercy and forgiveness and faithfulness and love. A king that is for you and with you. 2021 can be a year of rebirth and redemption and reconciliation and restoration for all of us. A year of hope and joy for everyone. You can be a citizen of the one true king and be a citizen of the kingdom, the only kingdom that matters. Thanks for watching, but don't stop there. We want you to find community at Grace Church, and the first step in doing that is going to gracechurch.us slash hub. There you'll find other sermons, details about upcoming events, and other important announcements. You'll also find service times and locations for all three of our Grace Church campuses. We would love for you to join us. And make sure you subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out when we post something new. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you next time.